In this episode, I'll share with you my approach to evaluate CT pulmonary angiogram to detect pulmonary embolism. Throughout this episode, we will look at several cases to learn the technique for CT pulmonary angiogram and how to assess the quality of imaging for adequacy of interpretation. I'll show you examples of various artifacts that can affect the quality of scan and can potentially make your interpretation suboptimal. We will learn about the imaging protocols and parameters that can help us get rid of these artifacts. And then in the difficult situations, how to differentiate artifacts from true embolic defects. In various examples that I'll share with you today, we will learn how to differentiate acute and chronic PE. And then we'll also touch upon an important subject related to the assessment of right heart strain. We will look at various ways to assess the right heart strain and would look into detail which parameters are considered more reliable than the others. So let's begin. In our center, we generally use bolus tracking to perform CT pulmonary angiogram. And uh, uh, in this method, a region of interest, also called ROI, is placed in the main pulmonary trunk. And then uh, sequential axial images are acquired at this level until the contrast density, the Hounsfield unit in this area, reach the desired level, which then auto-triggers the scan. So for instance, uh, you can see an ROI has been placed here and then multiple axial images have been acquired until this desired density has reached. And at this point, the scan starts on its own. I wouldn't say that the example shown here is the most ideal because uh, first you can see that the ROI has not been placed in the main pulmonary trunk. It looks more like in the left main pulmonary artery. It should ideally be here. And then the size of this ROI should be bigger than that. It should be uh, actually more than 50% of the diameter of the main pulmonary trunk. Uh, anyways, nevertheless, this scan was of optimum quality and I'll show you the images now. Okay, so how do we assess the quality of uh, CT pulmonary angiogram for the adequacy of reporting? Well, different people use different methods. Uh, some people would like to measure the Hounsfield units or density of the contrast in the main pulmonary trunk. And if it's greater than 250 Hounsfield unit, then it's uh, considered optimum. Let's see the density here. I'll put an ROI in this area. And the density is 335, which is definitely very good. And... Uh, I generally eyeball the pulmonary artery to see if it's good enough for me to, to look for any filling defects in the pulmonary arteries. And uh, I would normally look at the main pulmonary trunk, the right and left main pulmonary arteries, slow bar branches, and segmental and subsegmental divisions. Um, this is not the ideal window to look at the pulmonary arteries, so we need to change the window to make it wide. And uh, again, some people would use predetermined set values, but I would generally play with it a little to change it to my liking. This looks all right. So what do you see here? The main pulmonary trunk, the right and left main pulmonary arteries, then we have lobar divisions, and then the segmental and subsegmental divisions in all lobes. So if you are able to see good contrast or pacification in the pulmonary arteries, that scan should be optimum for reporting. There can be several factors which can affect the quality of these scans, and we will discuss them with a few examples. I'll show you the cases and we'll see how the scan quality is affected by changing parameters or patient hemodynamics, or other background features like patient habitus, etc. One artifact that is quite commonly seen on CT pulmonary angiograms is this uh, streak artifact related to dense contrast in superior vena cava. You can see there is this linear high density streak artifact coming off superior vena cava, which can uh, produce low density areas artifactually within the right main pulmonary artery, and it can be confusing in some situations. So knowledge of this artifact in this particular area could be useful to get rid of it. Some people use saline bolus after contrast bolus to get rid of this artifact. And also looking at the images in different planes like coronals or sagittal is also helpful. Okay, so how to assess the pulmonary tree for any embolism? I would generally start with the main pulmonary trunk, would we'll look at it through and through, starting from its outflow tract, and then going up the right and left main divisions, the low bar divisions on either side, and then segmental and subsegmental. And I would keep on changing the window, and uh, you can also you know, look at them in individual lobes. You can look at the right upper lobe first, uh, following each and every branch as far as you can go. Sometimes you're not able to see subsegmental divisions, and then in that case, you need to mention that in your report that to what level 
you could say with a level of certainty that there have been no filling defects or otherwise. So I'm now looking at the right middle lobe and then the right lower lobe. Similarly, on the left side, I would follow the same approach. I would look at all the arteries, the main arteries, their divisions, segmental and subsegmental. And uh, this is a normal scan. I already knew about that. I was just showing you the technique. Um, and then a few important points here that sometimes the contrast in the pulmonary veins is very similar to the pulmonary arteries. And pulmonary veins are more likely to have flow artifacts and defects, artifactual defects in pulmonary arteries. So it's useful to follow each and every vessel uh, to their uh, origin or termination, especially if you find filling defects in them. And uh, some of these linear areas here, they are related to plate atelectasis and it shouldn't be confused with abnormal pulmonary vasculature. After that, we can uh, measure the size of the main pulmonary artery as well as the heart chambers to look for any signs of elevated right heart strain. So naturally with uh, pulmonary emboli, and pulmonary emboli is one of the reasons for increased right heart strain. And if the right heart strain has, is increased and you find it on imaging, it's very important to mention it in the report because this can affect the prognosis and also the management options because in some centers, presence of elevated right heart strain um, in the presence of acute pulmonary embolism requires thromboembolectomy. So this then requires referral to the interventional team for further management. Okay, so how to assess the elevated right heart strain? There are several things that we can use and measure to evaluate the right heart chambers. One of them is the diameter of the main pulmonary trunk itself. So where do you measure this diameter and what is considered normal and when is it called abnormal? Well, to measure the main pulmonary artery diameter, you need to choose a slice where the division into right and left main pulmonary artery is shown at the same level as the main pulmonary trunk. So this is the ideal image. You can see main pulmonary trunk and its division into right and left main pulmonary arteries. And then you can just measure the distance. So in this patient, it's about 1.9 centimeter. So the normal upper limit generally in males is about uh, 2.9 centimeter and in females it's 2.7 centimeters, but there can be a lot of variations. These variations can be related to the phase of imaging, uh, contrast phasing, phase of the cardiac cycle, and also background features like patient's habitus, and we talked about gender, and any other background features. So measuring the ascending aorta diameter and comparing it with the pulmonary artery diameter is more useful and reliable method to assess pulmonary artery dilatation. For this, after measuring the main pulmonary trunk, we measure the maximum diameter of the ascending aorta at the same level and then take the ratio. So you can see that the ascending aorta diameter at this level is 2.5 cm and the main pulmonary trunk is 1.9 cm. So the ratio of the two, the um, main pulmonary artery to ascending aorta diameter ratio is generally considered 1 is to 1 in uh, normal healthy adults. Although in children, the pulmonary artery diameter can be normally higher. So in adults, um, this ratio greater than one with main pulmonary artery diameter greater than the ascending aorta diameter is considered abnormal and one of the signs of uh, increased pulmonary artery pressure. Okay, what else? Well, the second sign is looking at the reflux of contrast into IVC. In this case, you can see that there is no reflux of contrast into IVC and I'll show you a few examples of how reflux of contrast into IVC and intrahepatic veins looks like. And then the third sign is looking at the interventricular septum. Well, here you can see that the interventricular septum, it's quite smooth. And also, if you look at it carefully, I mean, obviously this is the right ventricle and this is the left ventricle, you can see that it is slightly bowing towards the right ventricle. That's its normal position. If the right ventricular pressure increases, this interventricular septum can become flat or eventually it can start bowing towards the left ventricle. So these signs are important to look at um, to assess the increasing right ventricular pressure. And then the fourth and the most important sign, and I must say most reliable sign, is the difference in the diameter of right and left ventricles. Well, you can imagine that the left ventricular diameter should be greater than right ventricle. And any reversal of this relation may suggest elevated right heart pressure. So how do you measure ventricular diameters and how do you compare them? 
Well, first of all, to measure this diameter, we need to find a slice where we can see the maximum diameter and we, both the right and left ventricle diameters, we don't need to measure on the same plane. We can always do it on the different slices. We just need to look for the image where they are at their maximum diameter. So let's look at the left ventricle first. So this is probably the location where we can see its maximum diameter and then we will measure it. So we wouldn't include this muscular layer. We'll just measure from endocardium to endocardium. And this is about 4.3 centimeter. And let's see the right ventricle now. So when you're measuring right ventricle diameter, be careful not to include the right atrium. Uh, and it would be useful to identify the tricuspid valve to avoid falsely measuring the right atrium. Okay, so this is, I think, uh, where we can find the best, um, the maximum diameter of right ventricle. And for instance here, if I measure, again, from endocardium to endocardium, you can see that it's 4.0 centimeter. And this is definitely less than the left ventricular diameter, which was 4.3. So again, normally the ratio of the right ventricular maximum short axis diameter to the left ventricle maximum short axis diameter is less than one. If this ratio exceeds one, then this is the most specific indicator of increased right heart strain. If Even if you find other signs of uh, raised right heart pressures, for instance, there is reflux or contrast into IBC, the main pulmonary trunk looks dilated or the septum has an unusual flattened position, even then, you need to have this sign as well to call it elevated right heart pressure or increased right heart strain. And like I said before, this is an important thing to mention in your reports because this could affect the prognosis and the patient management. Okay, what else do we need to look at on our scans? After that, or we must look at the soft tissue windows and lung windows. For lung windows particularly, we are looking for any infarcts or any other reason to explain the shortness of breath or tachycardia because that's mostly the, the signs and symptoms that patients present with and sometimes you have other reasons to account for these symptoms, um, especially in patients who do not have pulmonary emboli and uh, you incidentally ca can find uh, lung fibrosis or tumor or metastases, etc. And uh, soft tissue windows would be extremely helpful to look at any lymph nodes or any other pathologies. You would need to look at the soft tissue, bones, and the covered upper slices. And in a situation where you do find pulmonary embolism, you still need to look at all these things, And but also you need to keep a close attention for the presence of malignancy because many a times occult malignancies first time present with pulmonary embolism. So keep an eye for any malignancy on the scan. Thank you for joining me in this tutorial. If you found it helpful, please like, share, and subscribe for more content. For any questions or feedback, feel free to drop a comment below. Until next time, Happy learnings.